This is the part two video podcast on the impacts of urbanization on hydrology. And here we're going to get into the meat of it. What has actually happened to hydrology in terms of water cycle, water balance issues, runoff hydrographs, and then what have been changes to channels and floodplains in terms of the channels themselves, uh, what's happened to structures on the floodplain, and then ultimately how that's affected sediment and flooding risk. Okay, the first thing is that as part of urbanization, it's not just that people come into you know, land and start living there, it's that there's a complete replacement of natural systems with the urban infrastructure. Um, now, in the United States, this has all happened in the post-industrialized era at a time when you know, a meritocracy-based technocracy was responsible in the federal government to um, develop this infrastructure. We basically trusted the federal government, the Army Corps of Engineers, the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, and other agencies to help us figure out how this should get done. And there were really three main driving factors that, that underlie the uh, six different changes that you see listed here. I'm not gonna go through all those, but let me look about the underlying factors. For one thing, there was a human health sanitation issue. Uh, if you have wetlands, then you have malaria, right? Uh, if you have wetlands, that's going to be great soil for farmland. So you're looking at you know human health sanitization. Then, then as you have all this high density of people living together, you have sanitation problems. So you need to get rid of all of that waste, which means you need sewer systems. So sanitation, human health, one big factor. Another thing is efficiency. When you have large amounts of water moving through an urban area, you want to get rid of it as quickly as possible. That's the underlying philosophy in urban infrastructure. And so you want speed. And then the last thing is you want predictability. And that is a surprisingly large factor because when you look at natural landscapes, it's really hard to compute things. But when you simplify them with concrete and simple geometric structures, then it's very easy to use the equations of fluid mechanics and civil engineering to make predictions. And that is highly beneficial in a world of uncertainty. But even with that predictability of the physical landscape, you have to remember that it turned out that there were just horrible predictive capability for projecting the growth rates of population and projecting the growth rates of land utilization, as I talked about in, the, in part one podcast. And so these are the underlying factors that drive the nature of urban infrastructure as it's come to be in the United States. So the first impact is the hydrological cycle itself. On the left, you can see a natural setting where evapotranspiration, as we've talked about, consists of about 50 to 70% of the rain that falls out of the sky uh, ends up being evapotranspirated back. Um, groundwater, 10 to 30%, you know, surface storage, 1 to 10%, and the rest, 10 to 30% of the water running off. Um, I use the symbol Q here indicating discharge in a stream. So this discharge past the watershed outlet. Now when you urbanize, what are we doing? We're taking the natural ground surface that's relatively porous and permeable, and we're replacing it with concrete. And the consequence of that is, and I'll show you some more numbers of this in the third lecture on urbanization, uh, I think that's lecture 10, um, is that you decrease um, the ability of water to percolate down. So with less infiltration, that means you're gonna dramatically decrease the groundwater recharge. There's also gonna be less surface storage. There might be some ponding on the concrete, but compared to the amount of water stored in the soil in the shallow zone, it's, it's not very much. Um, with less plants around and less soil, then there's going to be less evapotranspiration. And then if all those things are going down, the one thing that will respond and go up is going to be runoff. Let me illustrate this, the hydrological response to urbanization using a case study, and this is the first of, I think, four in this um, you know, chapter overall. And this is going to be from Bray's Bayou, which is south of Houston, Texas. It's located in Harris County, which is the third most populous um, county in the United States. So, uh, you know, and when you look at this Google Earth image, and I've, I've shown the roads, you can see again that, you know, road infrastructure is always a very powerful visual signature of urbanization on the landscape. A remarkable hydrological study was done and published by ESPY in 1969. 
What you can see here on the x-axis is time, and on the y-axis is discharge. We remember we use a symbol Q. And the numbers here are in units of 100 cubic feet per second. So 25 means 2,500 or 2,500 cubic feet of se per second of water. Um, the lines that you see on here, these curves actually, these are called hydrographs, and we've talked about that before. A hydrograph is how the discharge in a river changes through time. And this isn't just any hydrograph, but it's something called a unit hydrograph, and that's covered in HYD 141, the physical hydrology class. A unit hydrograph is the discharge resulting from one inch of rain excess rained over a basin uniformly and applied at a uniform rate for a specified time. So, you know, if I'm, if I'm the whole uh, watershed, water is just raining down uniformly, um, you know, e equally over all areas of the land, um, producing one inch of runoff, essentially. Like, rain excess pretty much means runoff. If you look at how the unit hydrograph has changed for Bray's Bayou, um, if you begin with the line with the three dots, line three dots, that's... July 10th through 12th storm from 1939. You can see, as always in hydrology, you know, response, you get a very quick, um, what we call the rising limb of the hydrograph. So the, the onset of runoff is relatively abrupt, and then the recovery from the storm is very long lived. And so um, if we actually took the integral of this curve, we could get the area under this graph which, because this is in units of cubic feet per second, would be the total volume of water for the full duration of that rainfall excess. Um, we can also look at the peak of the storm, which is you know, here about 18, uh, 1800 CFS. Um, we can look at the total duration of the storm, which runs off beyond where the graph is. Um, and we can look at the time from the onset of rainfall excess to the peak, which is this um, delta C. Now we can See how uh, these lines are given for 1940, 41, 53, 59, and 60. And so if we just look at the last two, 59 and 60, there's a dramatic difference that's here. And I've highlighted the four things. First, oh, excuse me, a, a shorter period of total runoff. So total runoff being more than 85 hours after the start of rainfall excess, dropping to 70 hours. So more than 15 to 20 hour decrease in the overall time of runoff. Second, a quicker time to peak, so going from the start of, of rainfall excess to the peak here, less than five hours versus what it originally was, which was you know 10 to 15 hours. Um, a higher peak, so instead of around 1800 CFS, more than you know about 45 to 50, uh, well, 4500 to, to uh, 5000 CFS. So more than three times higher peak discharge, which also means higher stage, you know, more likely for flooding for sure. And then if we look at the overall volume, it's hard to tell visually, but actually these peak curves have a much higher volume of total runoff. So those are the four effects of the hydrological changes due to urbanization. Um, I want to show you this in a, in a more complicated way. Uh, if we just focus on, from this previous graph, the blue here, the change in peak, we saw a three times increase in peak. So the question is, how does that ratio of post-urbanization to pre-urbanization peak runoff, how does that change as a function of degree of urbanization? Um, so on the y-axis here is essentially a measure of degree of urbanization given as percent of the watershed that's paved. Now the interesting thing is that this is highly sensitive to um, the size of the flood that occurs. Um, on the x-axis here we have flood recurrence interval. Uh, recurrence interval basically means that, you know, oh, on the left here we have relatively small magnitude floods that occur very frequently. One means it occurs once a year, so that's kind of like the mean annual flood. And then if it's less than one, it means it's occurring more than one time a year. 0 0.1 means 10 times in a year. Um, on the other hand, you go out here, 100 means that the odds are that it's only going to happen once in 100 years which means that there's a 1% chance of occurring in any given year. So if we look at this, if we go to point three, and we have a basin that's 20% paved, what I want you to do next is look at these contour lines that are shown here. This is a contour line for 20, um, then it goes 15, 10, 4, 3, 2, and 1. 
Those contour lines show the ratio of the peak discharge after urbanization to that before urbanization. So that's exactly what you see here in blue from the earlier slide. That's that ratio. And so what this is showing with 20% of the basin paved, um, for a relatively small storm, there's 20 times more water after urbanization than before. You come here to like a nine year event and there's only two times more. You go out to a hundred year event, you know, there's barely, you know, 1.3 times more or something like that. So there's a dramatic difference. Now the question is why is there diff this difference? And the reason is because of the storage capacity. Remember from forest hydrology, we talked about interception, stem flow, the homework with gashes model, trying to compute what is the storage capacity of an individual tree based on the canopy storage capacity and the trunk or stem storage capacity. Well, a watershed works the same way. A watershed has a storage capacity in terms of the groundwater recharge it can do, in terms of the soil storage capacity and surficial ponding, and then as well storage capacity in trees and evapotranspiration. So those are all what we call the loss terms compared to runoff. And the loss terms pre-urbanization are extremely high, like a very large percent of small storms gets absorbed by a watershed producing relatively small runoff. When you urbanize, that's largely gone and you get a dramatic increase, up to 20 times more water after urbanization than before. On the other hand, for a very large flood, the reality is that in short order, you're going to exceed the capacity of that watershed to hold that water. I mean, you're talking about massive storm. It may be very long lived or just at such a high intensity that the watershed is going to be saturated and running off. And whether you have urbanization or not is a relatively small effect. So really from a, from a policy or societal perspective, it's not what happens in the largest floods where urbanization makes a difference. It's really in these mid-sized floods, like events that occur every one year to 10 years. And those are things that we really feel as a society because we're gonna experience those you know, five to 10 times in our life. And you take an event like that and you make it like, like, like SB found, you know, three times larger than what it was before, then that's going to have a huge effect on flooding potential. So I know this is a relatively complex diagram. I encourage you to think about it. Don't worry about the numbers with the stick so much. Just focus on the contour lines. So how did civil engineers, as part of urbanization, how do they handle the water? An important thing to understand is that rivers are not naturally sized to carry all the water that comes out of a watershed. And the main reason for that is when you have a large disturbance and, you know, like a big flood and the water goes down, there are simply too many years without those large floods during which time the channel recovers. This is something I talked about before with disturbance, that the way a channel recovers is vegetation. The vegetation can grow into the area that was damaged and um, it can then capture the sand and fine sediment from smaller events and reconstruct the channel margins and, and put it back together again. So what this, this is a cross section of the land and the line that it's very hard to see but it just dips down here, that would be the natural channel as it existed um, you know, prior to urbanization. And you can see that the channel itself, uh, it, it's, it's defined as a geometric shape, like that U shape that you see classically, but it's relatively small dip. And so really the way that a channel is protected is that when a flood occurs, much of the water gets sent out onto the floodway. And as a result of that, um, the energy in the channel doesn't grow as fast as it otherwise would. Uh, from an urbanization perspective, of course, people want to live near the channel. They want to live on the flat area we call the, the floodplain, that flat depositional surface. And uh, <clears throat> as a result of that, they're highly at risk of flooding. And as I'm going to show you in a few minutes, you'll see that the history is that they urbanize the floodplains, a big flood eventually comes, and then they have to change. And the main change is to simply entrench a channel where the, the small channel used to be, make a vastly larger channel there. And the other aspect of it, it's not just keeping the same natural shape but sinking it into the ground, it's changing the shape to this trapezoidal or rectangular shape um, 
And what that does is it creates a very high degree of predictability where simple equations from engineering can be used to specify the design and operation of those channels. Alternatively, um, especially in more dense areas and smaller creeks, is to just completely erase these channels from the landscape by putting them into underground pipes. So, you know, every little small creek has a chance of flooding or eroding and causing damage to the urban infrastructure. As a result of that, you just erase it from the landscape. You just put it in a box underground and forget about it. And we just now we would just call that a sewer. There's a variety of physical habitat changes associated with channelization, and I'm not going to go through this, but I encourage you to read it. A natural channel attributes on the left and man-made channel attributes on the right. In general, natural channels are more heterogeneous. Not only do they have more physical structures, but there's a lot more biota that are in there, and then that biota creates in-channel habitat, like you know, wood that lodges in the channel or boulder you know, wood boulder assemblages that create a diversity of habitats, both for aquatic species to find refugia during larger events or refugia in the sense of hiding from predators, um, but then also in terms of riparian habitat, having shading or overshading of the channel, having, um, you know, contiguous long riparian quarters as migratory pathways for terrestrial species. You know, most organisms need to get to rivers to get their water, but they don't necessarily live by the river all the time. So let me show you, continuing the story about Bray's Bayou, it's not just that there were hydrological changes, but there was a fundamental change to the channels as well. And so what you can see on the left is an artist's rendering of Project Bays. Um, the interesting thing to note here is that the aesthetic of a river in an urbanized area is governed by the discipline of landscape architecture. And so it's easy to sit here and say, okay, well, civil engineers, you know, have caused all these problems. But really, of course, it's, it's society and, and uh, landscape architects are the visions for what, how these change. And then civil engineers are often implementing those. And there's a, a hand in hand there. But a key thing about landscape architecture is it's, it's often seen as artistry. Uh, when I was a graduate student at UC Berkeley, I'd go past the landscape architecture department and I would see these projects in which you'd have essentially artists using the landscape to um, work out their emotions the way a poet does in their writings. You'd see you know, a, a lightning bolt river, you know, like somebody with a lot of angst and, you know, let's turn the landscape into my, my personal angst. But more commonly, you see in landscape architecture, an idea of an aesthetic of what the landscape should look like that has nothing to do with nature and everything to do with culture. And in different regions of the world, if you travel around, you'll find that um, this aesthetic can be quite different. Um, this drawing illustrates a common aesthetic here in the United States, the idea of having grassy areas, you know, wide open vistas, you know, pedestrian walkways, channelized um, concrete corridors, and a few shrubs and trees around. This is an American aesthetic for what looks good as a channel. Um, but this is nothing, there's, there's almost nothing natural about what's, what's here. And of course, the primary purpose is to provide the civil engineers requirements for flood control and can, what we call conveyance, to be able to convey the flood through this deeply entrenched, oversized channel with no natural functionality. Um, on the right, you can see the construction and a photo of Bray's Bayou as it exists today. And you don't even have to go that far away. I mean, you know, here in California, um, you know, throughout the Sacramento region, we see these exact same design all over the place. If you just look around as you're driving on highways and overpasses, you'll see them fairly ubiquitous on the landscape. So let's move to case study number two, the Los Angeles River Basin. Los Angeles, of course, is the second largest city in the United States, so it's really an interesting case to look at. And you look at this, this Landsat kind of image of, of it, and what you can see is just the white indicating all of the urbanization, not only in the Los Angeles basin, but in the San Fernando Valley. Here's Pasadena. And so the um, Los Angeles River terminates at Long Beach, and it goes all the way through the city, and it cuts through the mountains, it heads up into the San Fernando Valley, and what you can see on the right image here is the watershed, it heads in all of these dry, mountainous areas, so relatively steep and dry, highly prone to forest fires, 
um, and that you know areas that can generate large amounts of water very abruptly. So remember from the rangeland lecture, one of the things that makes rangelands so dangerous is the fact that you can have rain far away from where you actually are, and you can have a large amount of water that's coming out of this system, and then it all has to funnel into this very narrow channel way um, in the urban core. Historically, these are some photos uh, from 1924. You can see the Los Angeles River in an unregulated state. As I mentioned earlier, you see the urbanization that's taking place, people living along the river, the industrial infrastructure with railroads on one side. In this case, you can see erosion control structures as people are, are trying to protect the land uh, um, adjacent to that. You can really see the arid rangeland context that was present in Los Angeles at the time. And then inevitably the massive flood comes. In this photo, I know it's a little hard to see, the water is shown in white and the, um, what, you know, like the white water caps here are shown in black. And this is just highly turbid, you know, mud laden water. Um, this one railroad has collapsed and everybody is standing on this bridge, you know, watching the spectacle. Um, I'll let you read the text here for yourself, but you know, an annual rainfall of 15 inches, um, steady soaking rain at 11 inches in five days. Um, so that's a pretty dramatic amount of water falling. You know, some people died, but the main thing is it, it really left um, a stamp, you know, of, of uh, you know, trauma from this kind of natural disturbance on a, on, a, on a town that was not really prepared to handle it. And so as a result of that, there was a very strong political drive that ultimately led to the reengineering of the L.A. River. Now just pause and think for a moment what LA was like in 1941 and what LA is like today, especially the growth that's taken place since 1970. There's simply no way that in 1941 um, they could engineer that now. Just think about it now. I mean, uh, you know, in this era, 2010 to 2020, compare that to planning for how things are going to be in 2100, eight, you know, 80 years from now. You just can't do it. I mean, there, you, ideally, you need to have some kind of flexibility built into the system, but there really wasn't any. It's just um, turning the river into a concrete, um, you know, channel way. And on the left, well, these are photos that show what the LA River is like today. Um, the classic photo on the right, I took this in uh, 1994 um, in near Long Beach. You can see a, a low flow channel. That's usually not natural water. That's return flows from industrial or agricultural water returns, primarily industrial uh, or municipal, I guess. Um, so that's there's that low flow channel and then the main channel and the 100 year walls. But of course, those were the 100 year walls as of 1940. And as a result of urbanization in short order, that no longer had the capacity to hold the flows. And so as a result of that, um, eight foot high walls have been built on top of this um, since this photo was taken in 1994. Besides these very large rivers, um, as I mentioned earlier, a very common aspect of urbanization is encapsulating the vast drainage network of small creeks and channels into concrete. Here's a map that shows um, Rock Creek outside of Wash or you know through Washington D.C. It was a Rock Creek drainage. Um, it's a beautiful parkway that exists in in downtown Washington D.C. And you can see that although the main river has been kept, um, all the drainage density has been lost. Um, so out of 64 miles of naturally flowing streams, only 27 miles were above ground in 1966. And of course, since 1966, it's gone uh, away even more. Um, here is Berkeley, um, University of California at Berkeley is here. It has some of the only what we call daylighted sections of the, of the river, but all these other drainages coming off the, the Berkeley, Oakland Hills have been put into sewers. Um, today there's a movement called daylighting streams. It's, it's been going on for a while, but um, trying to increase flood capacity by opening up those channels, or just trying to create some aesthetic. I mean, you can't really say you're going to get urban, uh, you're going to get a lot of natural functioning back, but if you just, you know, um, jackhammer out the concrete, open it up, and then restack the concrete blocks for bank protection, um, you can get some, some benefits, primarily aesthetic. 
Besides what's happening in the channel themselves, the floodplain has also undergone dramatic changes. And so inevitably, um, rivers do spill out of the channel, whether it's because there aren't uh, levees that are built or levees break or people dynamite levees. Uh, or the floods just simply overwhelms our understanding of levees or just overwhelms the, the design. Uh, design. I mean, the, we design for a certain size flood, as I'll talk about in uh, Chapter 8. And if that gets overwhelmed, it gets overwhelmed. The main problem that happens then is that, you know, natural rivers, um, once the water is out on the floodplain, you know, it's then the structures on the floodplain become barriers to the water flow. And so as water slows down, depth increases. And it's that increase in depth that then exacerbates the flooding even more, covering a larger area in, in floodwaters. And that's illustrated in the photo in the upper left. The lower right shows the other part of the problem, which is that channels themselves become overwhelmed with the detritus of human civilization. Um, here's a bridge, and here's all the debris on the upstream side that during the flood, you know, smash into that bridge. Once that bridge is blocked with debris, it's either going to fail, or if it's strong enough, it'll hold, and then more of the water will back up and spill it onto the land, increasing floodplain water depths. Another aspect of the way urbanization works is that we build massive number of roads over the river. Um, of course, from a, you know, a societal perspective, we don't want the inefficiency of all funneling you know, out of our way to a few bridges. Um, so every road becomes a bridge, and here's the downtown Chicago area, and you can just see how every road just crosses over it as if these rivers aren't even there. Um, okay, now the last set of points I want to make about the hydrological effects um, on rivers as part of this part two podcast has to do with sediment. And I can't show these examples without first saying something about how sediment works in a river. So um, the soil that's on the land both in the uplands and lowlands, um, gets picked up by the excess rainfall. The runoff carries that to the channel, and then that accumulates as you go downstream as there's more water bringing storm flow and more sediment. In addition to that, the water in the channel can scour the banks and bed of the channel, and so you have what we call sediment transport taking place. And this simple diagram here illustrates how much sediment is, is occurring. Um, and so we can look here at this arrow. The arrow is going to indicate is the channel cutting down, so the channel, you know, wherever the channel bed is, is it scouring down, is it eroding, or is the channel bed filling in with sediment? Um, so when this arrow swings to the left, you have degradation, and when it swings to the right, you have aggradation. Now what makes that swing? Well, if we add more water, so forget the fish, but just, you know, here's a picture. If we add more water, that creates more weight here. Um, then as that, as that right side tips down, then that arrow is going to swing to the left. And so, you know, you're just swinging this whole thing. And as that happens, the arrow is going to pour it towards degradation. So I'm going to use degradation, incision, cutting, erosion. It's all synonymous. And so more water means more power, more ability to cut. Um, similarly, if we slide this bucket of water, if we slide that out to the right, we can, that is indicated as increasing the, slopes, the slope of the stream. And just, just as with the weight, the farther the weight is out uh, um, on the edge here of this fulcrum, like in a teeter-totter, then the more that's also going to pull that down. And so as it pulls that down, that's going to swing the needle towards degradation. So high s slope means that you're going to be driving more gravitational force, which is expressed as velocity, and velocity causes scour. Um, so that's, those are the two things that are water related. Now on the left side, we have another part of the balance here related to sediment. If I put more sediment into the water, then um, that is going to be weighing that side down. The whole thing's going to tip up and the needle is going to be putting towards aggradation. So I, as I have more and more sediment relative to the amount of water, there's a greater chance that we can't carry all of that material, and so some of it is going to deposit. If I change the size so that I make it coarser, so you know, take the, this overall bucket and shift it to the, out to the outside edge, that's going to tip this thing down. So coarse sediment requires more force to move 
than fine sediment. And so the coarser it is, then the more it tips, points towards aggradation or fill. Um, and so we're going to be depositing that coarse material. The finer the sediment is, the easier it is to carry. And so that is going to tip the balance towards the middle or to, to, to cutting again. So the overall th idea here is that you know, when you make a channel very large, so remember with urbanization, we're making the channel very large. Um, you're taking water that would previously have spilled out onto the floodplain and you're keeping it in the channel. So you're concentrating all that flow. That means that you're dramatically changing the right side here. Another thing that you're doing is you might take a river that's meandering back and forth and just turn it into a straight. They might just cut it straight, get it efficient. That's going to make it much steeper <coughs> than it would be when it's sinuous because you're traversing the same length, but you're doing it as a straight line. So you have more water in the channel, and even though the channel is larger, it's still not nearly the size of the floodplain, and you're increasing the slope. And so all those factors together would lead towards degradation. So the channel has a tendency to maintain itself as a large channel. So that's the idea of how the system is supposed to work. So let's look at some of the actual realities of sediment. Um, now, that's what's happening in the channel, but the important thing is, let's just go back here for a second. Um, you know, engineers were thinking about what's happening in the channel. They designed it to be self-maintaining. But at the other side, you have the sediment problem. And so, sediment supply, right? So in 1941, there's no way they could know how much the watershed would change. And the big thing that happens with urbanization is that we dramatically erode the landscape more. So here is a, um, a, a schematic that shows the concept of what has happened in the eastern United States as a result of the cycle of land development. Um, initially, you had deforestation, which didn't produce a lot of sediment, but then you had intensive agriculture, and especially you know, with the development of the plow and, and mechanization of the plow uh, after the Civil War. And so we saw a dramatic spike leading up to 1900, 1910, of the amount of sediment coming out of the land and into the channels. Um, we call that sediment yield. So yield is the tons of sediment per square mile of land and, and how much th therefore is coming in. So a high yield means that you're disproportionately getting more sediment than water. So we know that urbanization yields more water, but in the process of urbanization, um, we have to denude the land first. And during that construction time, the denudation of the landscape, it turns out, creates an unprecedented scale of erosion to the land. And this was um, discovered by um, a guy named Rads Woolman, who is a famous geomorphologist and hydrologist who studied this phenomenon. Um, back in the you know, 1940s through 1970s, they didn't really have a concept that this was a bad thing. Today, when you look at urbanization, you see all kinds of technologies deployed, but most commonly what are called sediment fences. You, you'll see like lines of fencing at a very low level on the ground to try to hold the sediment at a construction site. But that was all developed as best management practices as a result of the work of, of Reds Woolman, and he discovered these dramatic spikes of sediment yield. So, What's happened to the landscape is that rivers historically have filled in as a result of the transformation from forest to um, agriculture and urbanization. If you also go back to the deforestation chapter, I think that was chapter five, there was a slide there towards the end that showed the amount of sediment yield associated with percent of deforestation. <coughs> so what's happening here is that at the same time that engineers are trying to shift this towards degradation, they didn't realize that the process of urbanization itself was dramatically shifting it towards aggradation by adding m massive amounts of sediment. So let me show you a case study that puts a lot of this together. Here in California, there's the San Lorenzo River, which drains to Santa Cruz, California. Um, so here's Santa Cruz and the mouth of the river um, at, uh, at the ocean. Um, and so you can see that it's draining through this, this large area. And you can see that 50% of the watershed is forested. Uh, very, very small amount of agriculture. Um, basically, it's, it's, a, it's a large 
semi-arid watershed that is predominantly forested. So not much of an effect that's there, but like any watershed, it can produce, um, you know, it can produce a lot of water. And here's some historical maps of Santa Cruz, 1866, 1940. You can see the San Lorenzo River had a lot of wetlands. The wetlands were drained and urbanization was instituted so that by 1940, you can see that all taking place. <coughs> then in December of 1955, a total of 20.11 and 12.82 inches of rainfall were recorded at these two different gauging stations. So a huge amount of you know, 20 inches of rain over a 13 day period, um, that's as much as you would expect to have in a year or more. And it doesn't really matter at that point. Again, remember, urbanized, not urbanized, forested, not urbanized. When you, when you have a very rare large magnitude flood, you, you don't see dramatically more water, but it's where the flooding impact takes place that, that the, the real math here changes. Uh, and here are some photos showing the flooding that, that occurred down in there. Total estimated flood damages um, were 8.7 million um, for that time. So the solution that the Corps of Engineers proposed, which is the typical solution, would be to create just what we've been talking about, you know, large trapezoidal type channel <coughs> that would drain out to the ocean and um, provide the, the flood capacity without having to, to flow over. Uh, in 1959, a cost of 6.466 million. That cost is less than the, the benefit that you would have in terms of a flood abatement of you know, 8.7 million. Uh, in today's dollars, um, $51.76 million worth of cost. Um, the key thing here, though, is that this is a project, as I'm going to show you in a minute, that is not a passive project, but it's a project that required active maintenance. And all it asked of the people was just to pay $25,000 a year to do maintenance, which is $200,000 today. This is a case where we have a little bit more complicated phenomenon um, and the devil is really in the details. So this is a, a little bit difficult sketch to, to understand. So just take a minute and think about it. On the x-axis is distance from the ocean. So zero, well actually so yeah, zero is the mouth, essentially like near the mouth. And then um, we're moving inland at, you know, 120 feet. Um, and then in the right is elevation. So this is this is definitely not to scale. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, these, I'm sorry. This isn't this isn't feet. This is wrong. These are station numbers. These are station numbers. Um, and I'm not sure what the distance is um, for each station. So it, it's certainly it's not 120 feet. So ignore the word feet there. You can see here the horizontal distance here is like 3,000 feet. So you have 3,000 feet of horizontal change to 10 feet of vertical change. So it's quite a long distance. Um, and then these are just you know, stations along that way. Then what you can see is that the bottom black line here is the designed river bottom. The other line that's a relatively straight line here is the Corps of Engineers baseline survey of where the riverbed was prior to the project. And then the red dashed line across is mean sea level. What you can see is that there's a crossover point between mean sea level and the pre-existing baseline bed surface right here around the Laurel Street Bridge. So this channel here is really like an estuary at the mouth. In order to make the channel deeper here, you run into a significant problem. To add that channel capacity, you actually have to cut below sea level. And that effectively shifts the estuary location a far distance upstream to this point here where the mean sea level line crosses the design river bottom. Um, so those two lines indicate that, you know, on one hand it feels like you're gaining storage capacity, but on the other hand you're not because all that storage capacity is below sea level. And as you can imagine, uh, during the times of floods, it's very likely that the ocean is also at a higher level as well because, you know, you get wind set up and maybe in conjunction with high tides, um, that you can get um, water at a very high base level. So the Corps of Engineers understood that that was what was going to happen, and that's why they required the local community to spend $25,000 a year to clean out any sand that either came in from the ocean or came down from floods to keep the channel clean at this design condition. 
But what you can see is that here in 1975, 76, 77, um, the bed elevation that's shown here, these, these polylines that you see, they're nowhere near the design river bottom. In fact, they're right at the baseline survey. So although the channel was wider than it was before, and so there's some benefit there, um, the channel was completely filled in and totally useless here in, in the 1970s. Uh, here are photos um, that you can see how the river looks. Uh, uh, and so you get the idea that, that somewhere buried in all this sediment is a channel. Um, but in fact, it's just completely filled in. And um, then you have the problem that now you have habitat there as well. So because the city did not follow through with their regularly scheduled maintenance, they've lost the flood storage capacity, making the project a complete waste. And um, you know, the question then is when a flood comes, Will the flood scour this out on its own, restoring the capacity and protecting this, the town, or will this fill cause the river to spill, o, spill out and get the flood damages anyway? Um, and the expectation is that the city is going to have to dig out this channel every five years um, to obtain the, de the design capacity. So that's an example where you have a mismatch between um, you know what's happening in uh, you know federal plans versus local implementation and the complication also of being near the coast. Those are all factors that make the design not work out well. Um, I want to just show one last thing. It's a little bit of a complicated concept, but I think it's also very important. When you look at the scale of the whole earth, there's a pretty interesting phenomenon as a result of essentially urbanization or human use of the land. This is a correct, first let's look at the map. Okay, the map shows the continents and the colors here indicate the amount <coughs> of, of sediment that's trapped in large reservoirs. So what, like on, on a percentage basis. So these black areas are areas where 80 to 100% of the sediment that's coming in is being trapped by the reservoirs. And then the other colors indicate that a lot of the sediment from those basins is not being trapped. So, um, you know, historically, like if we go back to the, um, result by Woolman, we can see that human disturbance to the land in terms of agriculture, road building, and urbanization has produced vast quantities of sediment. So you would expect that worldwide there would be more sediment affecting the land um, than um, without urbanization. But in fact, that has been offset because of the construction of massive dams all over the world. If we look at the x-axis here, we see the amount of sediment, um, cumulated, cumulated amount of sediment before human in influences. And on the y-axis is the cumulated amount of sediment, billions of tons per year, um, since, uh, you know, since humans have had a role. And so the black line in the middle shows the one-to-one -one line. If the effect of humans was non-existent, then we would just be plotting right all along this line. Well, what's actually happened is that as a result of reservoir construction, um, so on one hand, reservoirs catch the sediment, but on the other hand, you have us generating more sediment. Well, it turns out that the capturing sediment is winning. And these two lines here, if we look at trapping in large and small reservoirs, that's the total effect, the blue line. So the blue line shows that compared to before humans, the amount of sediment that's coming out from watersheds has decreased. So for example, if we, <coughs> if we would have had 5 billion tons per year before humans, then afterwards we now have about 4. So what's that? 20% reduction in sediment as a result of the reservoirs capturing that. So reservoirs are saving lowland areas from the effects of human activities farther up in the watershed. To see that again, if we were to ignore reservoirs, if we said, well, what if we didn't have reservoirs? Well, if we didn't have reservoirs, you take that 5 billion tons per year, you'd come up and you hit here and you go across, and I don't know, it's like 5.7 billion tons per year. And then the Yellow River is just, you know, has such a big effect that, you know, in and of itself, the trapping and the re reservoirs associated with the Yellow River, um, you know, uh, with trapping, what would be like, you know, I don't know, seven, you know, seven going to about 5.2, if you didn't have those reservoirs, 
the seven billion tons before would turn into you know eight and a half to nine billion tons. So this is a hard concept, but the, the general idea here is that <clears throat> humans have urbanized the land, and in the process of using land and urbanizing, we've eroded massive amounts of soils, okay? The effects of those soils are certainly hurting human civilization, but they're not hurting it as much as they would, and that is because of reservoirs. Reservoirs capture a lot of that sediment and therefore provide a little bit of a protecting benefit in that sense. Now, the sediment isn't good for the reservoir, so that's a whole other problem. Okay, so I'm going to pause here and we'll continue on in part three in a little bit.